Hello, welcome to the latest episode of season three of the web show Perspectives Live. This is a Colleges and Institutes Canada initiative where we talk about and share different perspectives on issues that matter to you. Today's episode is titled Health and Safety Comes First. We'll look at how colleges and institutes can better prepare themselves for providing safe spaces for their students, faculty, staff, and the many communities that they serve. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja. Before we get started, I wish to acknowledge that this episode of Perspectives Live is being produced and broadcast from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. I also want to add here that uh, as we have this conversation about safety, we know that the community at Michigan State University is recovering from an active shooter incident that left three students dead. Uh, our thoughts are with the school staff and the community there. Um, on another note, CICAN would like to recognize the ongoing contributions of its corporate partners, BGIS, TD Insurance, and Scotiabank, who support CICAN's activities, including bringing you this web show, Perspectives Live, in both English and French. And now I'd like to welcome CICAN's president and CEO, Denise Amio. Uh, hello, Denise. Hello, Manjula. How are you? I'm doing very well, Manjula. Thank you. And I realize it's probably a little late to say Happy New Year. But since I haven't <laughs> seen you this year, I will make an exception. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> thank you. It does feel like eons ago, but thank you. Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, now, the topic of our episode today really hits home for a lot of viewers, myself included. I live on the outskirts of Toronto, and it's been so shocking to see these. I'm sure that you've seen them in the news, reported in the news, Denise. There have been these violent incidents on the streets, uh, public transit, and uh, it's actually quite upsetting. I agree with you, Manjula. Uh, and, you know, uh, it makes me sad to think of all the people that are affected by these events. But even more than that, I'm sad for some of the root causes, whether it's mental health, addictions, the opioid crisis, the rise of anti-Black racism. It, we realize it's a circular circular uh, phenomena uh, that directly impacts the health and safety of not only our learners, but also of our staff. Uh, and mm. Canada's post-secondary institution campuses, they have not been immune to this either. And as you know, they are a microcosm of the larger society. And, and you know what? At the end of the day, they are a reflection of the culture that surrounds them. So if the society is healthy and safe and content, this is reflected on our campus. But unfortunately, conversely, when there's unrest, we see it also in our learners and in our faculty. That, that's that's actually a really good point. You're right. I mean, campuses aren't these separate spaces that that people go to, but are really a core part of the the regions that they're in. And I think when we think about the interconnectivity between post secondary organizations and the communities that they're in, it may seem obvious that there is that integration in remote or rural areas. But you know, as I said, like I live on the outskirts of Toronto and all of the, the campuses that I know in the in the region and, you know, Toronto being a major metropolitan area, like other major metropolitan areas, that integration also happens here. So the overall uh, social climate in that region has this ripple effect that affects the campuses as well. Absolutely, it does affect our campuses. And I'd like to mention that the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, they have been a top priority for CICAN. And when you looked at the 17 uh, SDGs, they do provide this framework for collaboration uh, among our members and our partners. And at the end of the day, it is to ensure uh, that our actions 
contribute to a positive change for the people and the planet. And if you just look at SDG 16, it is directly linked with the topic of today's show. Because this SDG 16, it challenges us to promote peaceful and inclusive societies. And this means that it would ensure that people all over the world can go about their lives free of fear, free from all forms of violence, no matter their gender, their race, or their, their sexual uh, orientation. And all that, Manjula, it starts on campus. And it includes providing safe and inclusive spaces. It, it means uh, providing resources to those in need. And it means equipping learners with the skills to help prevent future violence in their communities or in their future work. Mm, I, I'm so glad that you've brought up the SDGs and the, and the particular one that is linked to our topic today. I mean, these, these goals, uh, especially the goals around safety, it is a challenge. It's a challenge to meet these goals, not just for campuses, but for society as a whole. Um, we have a lot to talk about. I'm really excited about the panel. I'm excited because we have such a, an interesting array of guest speakers, Denise, to talk about uh, the complexities around uh, the challenge on the show today. You're right, Manjula. And you know what? It was difficult to narrow down the topic let alone the topical experts. Uh, but we felt it was important today to have a perspective from the student community, from the public safety field, and also a subject-specific reporter, and also one of your colleagues to weigh in. But you know, we could have gone even further with cybersecurity, racism, mental health, and so on. And because we already had two episodes last year addressing cybersecurity and mental health, we felt that people could look at those recordings of both, show both shows uh, on the YouTube channel of uh, CICAM. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, um, I know that we just had the French one. My, my colleague, Norman, just, uh, just uh, moderated the French version. And what I'm hearing is there are so many thing, themes that came up there that I think will come up on this show as well. It is going to be a keeper this session and a giver of content for so many future episodes, I promise, because I think, Denise, I think this is a very timely topic. I think a lot of people are thinking about this. I know you're thinking about it on campuses. I think people are thinking about it across the board as well. So I'm going to kick off the panel and we'll have you back, uh, Denise, in about 20 minutes to weigh in on everything along with Craig Stevenson, the president and the CEO of Centennial College in Toronto. So thank you, Denise. Well, you'll be back soon. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, with that, I'm going to welcome our panel now. They are Rebecca Edwards, who's a safety reporter with SafeWise.com. Hello, Rebecca. Good morning, Manjula. Since I know that you're a reporter, since uh, you're a reporter, I'm a reporter, you're going to get the tough questions. I hope you're prepared for that. Well, <laughs> we'll find out. I hope so, too. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, uh, it's always fun to report to, to talk to another journalist. Uh, Mackenzie Metcalf is the executive director of the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations. Good afternoon, Mackenzie. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, pleasure having you on. And uh, Pierre Yves uh, Bourdois is the president at PY Public Safety Management Incorporated and a former deputy commissioner of the RCMP. Welcome, Pierre Yves. Good afternoon, everyone. So I know that, uh, Pierre Yves, you, you are fresh off the French show, so you already have a couple of mm -hmm. uh, thoughts about how this discussion is going to go, and, and we're going we're gonna to get into that as well. Mackenzie, I'm going to start with you. I mean, the last uh, four years, we've gone through a few things in society that have really made us try to change our ways and also reveal issues that we haven't really 
paid enough attention to. So I'm thinking about the Me Too movement, you know, all these um, ongoing incidents that we're seeing of, of anti-Black racism, some really violent ones, the pandemic, they've been, and through the pandemic, more revelations about, about financial precarity uh, across the population in Canada. So I wanna, I want you to take us to seeing the campus through the eyes of a student. And I know that students come with vastly differing burdens, worries, and goals, but can you give us a picture of what they worry about um, as it pertains to safety? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say uh, that there are three main areas that I think are really topics of concern for students right now. Um, the first centering around pandemic recovery and COVID-19. Um, I think COVID-19 was difficult for many people, but it was especially difficult for students as they were in a very transition based period uh, in their life, often moving away from home for the first time, navigating new resources, a new community. Um, and we also saw that a lot of universities and colleges um, were really quick to adapt to make post-secondary education accessible to these students as we pivoted online. And there was a lot of really great things that happened. We saw our institutions were agile and able to adapt to some of the challenges, but we also know that there were some things that didn't work for students, um, the social isolation piece, which exacerbated mental health, which I will get into in a second. Um, but um, I think it's really important that we take the lessons learned from COVID-19 as post-secondary institutions, evaluate what worked, what didn't work, um, and use that to support students in their academic journey, as well as with their safety on campus. Uh, the one thing that really impacted students during COVID-19 was student mental health. Um, here at CASA, we actually uh, did a report with the Mental Health Commission of Canada that found three out of four students reported their mental health has been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this isn't just something that goes away overnight. This is something that an entire generation of students who were in post-secondary, who were in high school after, are going to have to deal with. And it's important that post-secondary institutions are equipped to be able to support students uh, through these journeys. Wonderful, thank you. And we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that that report because I'd be curious to hear about some of the findings from that report because I think you looked at mental health uh, of students across the country uh, through the pandemic. Wonderful. A period, if I can pull you into this, I mean, during the in introduction, Denise mentioned something that I thought was really powerful. This idea of campuses being a microcosm of society, right? Um, and it's and it's true. It's not yeah. like people have a passport and they and they come to school, they cross a border, yeah. and and they leave everything behind. You know, it's 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 really a porous kind of connection. People go out for their part time jobs. They go to stop by and visit family. People come in to make speeches. There are organizations from outside and inside the school that work together. So you're really seeing campuses um, integrated with the communities that they're in. So given that, what role would you say that other um, authorities and community services in that larger uh, region, in the, in the larger community, play in providing um, a sense of safety or even actual safety? Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting point because when you look at uh, safety and security on campuses, uh, there's the reality and there's also the perception. And uh, when you look at, at the overall agencies responsible for the well-being of staff, of students, of visitors, it is imperative that everybody uh, communicate with each other, everybody has a clear uh, uh, idea of some of the challenges that are faced both in our respective communities and on campuses. Case in point, for instance, there are uh, elements on the campus that have uh, views that are not shared by the large majority. So like society, there are currently uh, a polarization of views from the right and the left, and you need to be able to balance these views to ensure that uh, safety protocols and security are not broken. So there's a whole element of prevention, education for the staff, the students, and also um, kind of the um, enforcement or a clear framework within 
uh, institutions that uh, would allow students to flourish uh, in their academic pursuits. Mm. You know, you've touched on a couple of things there, there, um, Piri. Do you think that that responsibility falls on leaders within the institution? Or do you think that even outside agencies and authorities like the police, like uh, municipal governments, um, healthcare services also play a part in, in helping to provide that sense of safety or actual safety? I'm a strong believer in accountability. So there needs to be a single point of accountability with regards to safety and security on campuses, be it uh, private agencies uh, that reports to the dean or other uh, president of institutions. And there needs to be a bridge that are strong enough to sustain uh, potential uh, uh, serious um, um, uh, infringement of safety and security on campuses. For instance, uh, when I conducted a, a review of a large university in downtown Montreal with five different campuses right in the core of the city of Montreal, uh, there were clear protocols between, for instance, the municipal uh, police uh, agency and uh, safety on campuses. Uh, there were regular mm. meetings and there, were, uh, there was an open book of exchange with regards to potential a threat to the safety and security of staff, students, and visitors. Mm. Thank you, thank you, that, that, that does help. Rebecca, you've heard some of the things that Pierre is talking about here, right? And, and uh, uh, I know that you report on safety across uh, a wider cross-section and not just Canada, but North America, you look at, you look at it globally. Is campus safety a, a growing concern in other countries? Absolutely. I think that, I mean, safety in general has become much more to the forefront because of the global pandemic. But on campuses, it, I think there's been an interesting uh, trend that has followed uh, many things Mackenzie talked about, all those different things that were impacted by going through a global pandemic um, together. And the way that I've seen it show up in the U.S. specifically, but I see it reflected in other countries that have also We've sort of had the opportunity in 2020 to unite globally against a common threat, but unfortunately, rather than being universally uniting, um, that uh, the pandemic and the measures taken to try to protect people have been divisive in a lot of different countries, and especially the U.S., I think, is a fantastic case study in this division taken to extremes. And what it's done is it's made every place feel less safe. And unfortunately, campuses are the same place. You know, colleges and institutes have been seen in the U.S. specifically as safe spaces. You mentioned safe spaces in Canada, and even the term safe spaces is a dangerous thing to say on a lot of U.S. campuses now. So I think that um, a lot of progress that we were making with Me Too, with a lot of things, has been a little bit eroded by the division and insecurity and these extra stresses of people not knowing where to go. And if you don't know who to trust, and you don't know who to rely on, it's very hard to feel safe and it's very hard to feel united. I think going to a college or an institute, you were all on the same team. You could cheer for the, you know, the sports teams, you were united by things and we're not as trusting in being united anymore. And I think that lack, the division definitely erodes uh, the sense of safety and the ability for all those parts to work together to the same cause of caring for one another. It's interesting because when I when I think of what you're talking about and I think of how, you know, if I can use the term in the days of old, there used to be a time where safety meant uh, not getting injured or not getting assaulted, being able to walk through a space and it just it meant physical safety. Right. And right. and I don't yeah. think um, a couple of de decades ago we would have thought emotional safety. But I, I just wonder, has the definition of safety changed? Because it doesn't seem to be about just that anymore. I feel like we're now in the, are we creating welcome environments? I don't know, Pierre, because I, I hear you say aloud, yes, I'm going to start off with you. Has the <laughs> definition of safety changed? I should keep my poker face like a police officer face here because uh, <laughs> sometimes I have a tendency to open up like this. But, but the fact of the matter is indeed, and social media has a huge part 
uh, and, and influence the perception of safety. And again, I'm, ba I'm back to the reality of, of, of what's out there and the perception of it. And uh, social media play a big part in both uh, you know, spreading fear amongst people and also uh, uh, polarization of point of views in relation to particular events. Uh, talking about uh, racialized individuals, talking about the LGBTQ community and so on and so forth. And there are these dialogues online that are um, have a negative impact uh, with regards to safety and security. So looking at the uh, security apparatus on in, in institute, on campuses, and so on and so forth, the people responsible for this needs to, they need to manage this perception and the reality to ensure that there's an open dialogue and try to set the record straight with regards to elements that are put in place to ensure that students feel safe in their environment. And it's an ongoing challenge for uh, safety agencies responsible uh, for uh, campuses uh, security. What do you make of that, Rebecca? I, I, Mackenzie, I see you nodding to Rebecca. I'll start with you. I mean, you've talked about seeing the divisiveness that is out there. Now, of course, again, we've talked about it being a microcosm of larger society. You're seeing that on campus as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, it is that definition of safety and taking safety in that broader context that it's not just our physical safety. Can I walk to my car safely at night or can I walk from this building to the other? But there's mental and emotional safety. And um, I think and yeah, I mentioned trust. I think the erosion of trust is a, a core um, component of what is negatively impacting um, that gap between perception and reality, which is, I love that Pierre, you've said that because it's something that I study a lot because the things that we fear often um, are outsized things that we see on social media, the big headlines that pop up and it, news and information can come to us constantly now without us even seeking it out. You don't have to choose to watch the show. You can have a message pop up on social media. I can have my mom email me something. I mean, you're getting stuff from so many different places that it can become overwhelming. And I think we can get distracted by focusing on the wrong things and, um, not those little every day, the maintenance of creating that safe space and that place and knowing who to trust, who's enforcing safety on campus, who do I go to if I need help? Um, there's a lot more questions, I think, than I feel like we used to think we had. <laughs> mm. And I'm going to put a, a peg in that erosion of trust thing and come back to you a, a, a bit in a bit, Rebecca, because I think that is a really large ask to put on an administration to have to deal with the erosion of trust. But we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, Mackenzie, I want to pull you in here because we've been we've been mentioning mental health. It's come up a couple of times. Uh, your organization did a study on the state of student mental health in Canada. Can you talk to us? Uh, you know, I know it's a huge report, but somewhat briefly about the findings of that report. Yeah, so uh, in September, the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations worked in partnership with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, um, and we conducted a survey with Abacus data that surveyed students um, about the state of mental health in Canada, and we found a couple striking things. Um, some key facts and figures from the report include one in two students reporting accessing mental health services through their post-secondary education, 74% of students saying the pandemic has worsened pre-existing mental health challenges. Um, so what we know is that students had a hard time from COVID-19. This doesn't go away and that students are looking to post-secondary campuses as spaces and as leaders within their communities to help them work through a lot of these problems that they're having. Um, and we couple that with the cost of living and other financial pressures that students are um, facing right now. Groceries have record high inflation. Rent is going up in many parts of the country. Um, and this report also indicates that relationships with both family, friends, along with reliable housing are crucial for the mental health and well-being of students. And um, so though we can look at mental health as something uh, that happens on 
post-secondary campuses and that bad mental health um, is something that unfortunately has become kind of part of the student experience. Um, students are kind of coming back and saying, hey, COVID-19 was especially difficult for us. We need additional resources um, and we want to work with post-secondary education uh, campuses to make sure that those resources are accessible and meet the needs of what students are looking for for support. Wonderful. And and very quickly, because I know that we will get emails asking, where can people find that report? Yeah, you can find it on CASA's website. The report is called The New Abnormal. The New Abnormal. Thank you. Thank you for that. So let's talk um, for a little bit of time about uh, solutions. I mean, we've laid out a couple of things here. And uh, Pierre, Pierre, I'm going to start with you on the solutions front, and 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 we'll go uh, we'll go through uh, everyone here. You know, given all we've heard, what do you think? And and it's a, uh, you know, as an outsider, I can say this: there's a lot on the plate here. There is a lot on the plate compared to what perhaps a leader in an institution would have dealt with two or three decades ago. This is a lot. I mean, Rebecca, you've mentioned erosion of trust. I don't even know how someone takes that on. But anyway, having said that, given all we've heard, what can Canada's colleges and institutes do to implement, uh, or do or implement to create a safer, healthier environment for their, their staff and their students? What would you like to see done? There needs to be concrete action that are visible and understood by the staff and the students about what is actually happening with regards to safety and their safety and security because it's all about them so therefore you know there needs to be clear communication and it needs to it needs to be organic it needs to grow with the time and change what was interesting this morning when we have an earlier discussion uh on the french side uh there was a very interesting uh, uh initiative in one of the institution uh in institute in in quebec uh, called sentinels so they they were over 300 of these sentinels that were f formed part of the core of the students of these institutions that would be the the eyes and the ears of uh the 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 safety and security apparatus of these particular campuses and therefore, if there would be some type of mental breakdown, for instance, with, uh, with uh, students experiencing for various reasons, high levels of stress, before there are dire consequences for this individual, these sentinels would get involved and would, would assist the individual, would offer options for their consideration in order to avoid potential huge mistakes and potential tragic uh, results for a and individuals and other individuals that are uh, living on on these campuses thank you um mackenzie do you want to take a take a stab at talking about solutions yeah um, what have you seen work? are there to... are there are... yeah <laughs> Go ahead. so i also wanted to make a point because um there's been a lot of conversations about the scope of safety on campus and how it's expanded. And I think this is because uh, students in this generation and in my generation have a vocabulary about certain things that just didn't exist before, right? When I think about my parents mm -hmm. and what they experienced when they attended post-secondary education, mental health wasn't a conversation that was being had. Gender-based violence um, wasn't something right. that people talked about out in the open. So I think it's important Yeah, it wasn't that people weren't experiencing um, it. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. that people weren't experiencing it. My apologies more. for interrupting. It's more that, yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, so I think that that is something to know, but also that um, community on post-secondary education campuses is what's really important because from my perspective, that's how you rebuild trust, whether it's with an institution, with between a student body and an institution, um, because then you get everyone sitting next to each other in a stadium uh supporting a football team feeling like they're a part of something and like they have something in common with their neighbor um so community on post-secondary education campuses is something that definitely needs to be prioritized as we come out and rebuild after COVID 19. Um, but i do have an example of a college campus that has done some really great work around gender-based violence prevention specifically red river college uh, and their no wrong door initiative that's trauma-informed response 
response um, to gender-based violence, uh, they partnered with a program called RESE. It stands for Respect, Educate, Empower Survivors. Um, and this allows members of a mm -hmm. campus community to create a record of uh, an incident of gender-based violence, as well as let them choose what to do with that record, whether they report it anonymously, report it through their campus, through the police, or they create an ID um, for themselves within a system. Uh, so this is something that I have heard great things about through different student connections um, on campuses. Um, but the last thing I'll just reiterate is that the best way to create safe spaces for students is to listen to students and the concerns that they have. Um, whether there is uh, stories that students are telling you, I know a lot of times there's data gaps with things like this that are really unfortunate, um, but student perceptions are important because that impacts a student's mental health, how they interact with their community, how safe they feel coming to their campus. So if everyone can come from a place and specifically administrators can come from a place of listening to students, student leaders, and student unions on their campuses. That's a great first step in creating safe communities for everyone, especially students. That's such a powerful point, Mackenzie, the idea that, that um, you really need to listen, right? I mean, you started off by telling us, by giving us that picture on the ground of, of what students are thinking about when they think about safety. So you know, yes, I think it's important to listen. Are there ways that that can be done or are there ways that you've seen it done that work? Any kind of formal approaches yeah. that you that you came across even in your study? For sure. Um, in 2018, the government of Ontario actually commissioned the Student Voices on Sexual Violence Survey, which they did across every post-secondary institution in the entire province. Um, and this was a really great initiative that many provincial advocates have been pushing to be repeated um, because it gave us that data that I think university administrations and college administrations were so desperately craving to back up a lot of the stories that students had been saying on their campuses. It's hard to invest millions of dollars into a general feeling of unsafety. But if you have something more concrete like statistics and data about um, different incidences that have happened on post-secondary campuses, it's a lot easier to take those lived experiences, match them with data and create trauma-informed and data-informed responses. Um, so that's an example of, I think, a great initiative that we saw in 2018 and that um, could produce great results other places in Canada and around the world. And there's a, there's, you know, an opportunity here for, for institutions to also collaborate to do more of these studies because we've already identified that what is affecting people in one side of the country, like some of these themes are true in probably every campus that you can think of. So there are opportunities here for campuses to, to collaborate and come up with, with what they hear from their listening to, to share ideas as well. Um, Rebecca, uh, before, before I uh, move on to bringing on my, my uh, next set of panelists, and I want to put that to you too. What are some things that you've seen uh, colleges and institutes, universities, post-secondary institutions do to, to prepare to create better and healthier environments? I love what McKinsey said about listening. And that's, you know, when I mean bring the erosion of trust, I don't think that that is born on the campuses. I think that is influenced by the wider world, that community, you know, and the campus is a microcosm. Um, so listening, having play places and ways for communication and um, experiences to be shared back and forth. And I think utilizing the people, I loved the Sentinel example, and also utilizing technology. Technology, there are a lot of technological ways that you can help build that community and that you can um, put kind of safeguards and proactive safety practices in place using technology that is available, um, whether it's to let people know of something going on on a campus, like what happened at Michigan State, um, so that people can, you know, behave in a safe manner in a, you know, terrible event, um, or just regular um, ways that you can check in or be connected and that you know where to go to find those listening ears um, and to find that help and ask, say, hey, I need, I need something. And I think um, utilizing technology in the mix is something that we would be remiss to not, um, to not throw into the strategy. 
Thank you. Uh, Piri, uh, one last question to you. Um, I know that uh, Rebecca had just mentioned that the the awful incident at, at Michigan State. I mean, we haven't really had, yeah. we've had a couple of incidents of that kind, but I don't think that we've had it. Rebecca, I hate to say, I'm not trying to compare our Canada to the States here, but we, we don't see that problem as much here. However, I do think that we do have incidents um, and we do have um, failure sometimes when it comes to safety. And that could be violence on campus. It could be how a particular issue was dealt with. It could be a cybersecurity incident. Um, and sometimes what we have to do is learn from failure. So you might not get it right the first time, but you better be, you know, you better be a little bit better the second time around. Talk That's to right. us about that importance of the aftermath and the postmortem and, and how campuses can do that and learn from that. Uh, the secret is tabletop exercise. It's it's to create different scenarios that are uh, that could potentially happen, and also sometimes the unthinkable. And I just can't help but think of this school bus that drove into a kindergarten in Quebec last last week. I'm thinking about Michigan. From what I'm tracking, this individual that walked into on on campus was not even associated with the campus. So you need to practice, and Mackenzie ma mentioned like uh, the data that are, that's available, and also uh, apocal apocalyptic scenarios that could potentially unfold on, on campuses. So each and every one needs to do these regular tabletop exercise, whereas you look at a potential or a fixed scenarios, and then you clearly define the roles and responsibilities of each agencies that could potentially be involved in these types of scenarios. I've worked uh, with few universities and, and, campus, uh, and campuses, whereas we work these scenarios and we... Everybody feels that oh. they have vested interest on the, uh, on the positive outcome. Mm. Perry, thank you very much. Uh, hold on to those thoughts. Lots of good stuff. Stay at the table, the virtual table that we have. I'm going to bring on uh, a few more people here. I'd like to welcome uh, Denise Amio, the president and CEO of CICAN, and Craig Stevenson, the president and CEO of Centennial College, who've been listening in. Welcome to the table. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, so, Denise, uh, there's been a lot, <laughs> a lot of ideas here, um, a lot of issues that have been identified as well. So, so let me start with you. Could you reflect on what you've heard so far from our panel? Uh, absolutely. Um, what I'm hearing is that every college talk about issues of safety. Uh, and security. They all talk about mental health also, and they all say that it is rising. What I'm seeing right now is that, you know, when you looked at post-secondary, it is uh, the primary access points to post-secondary education uh, for vulnerable people. Uh, whether they are um, women, indigenous, racialized, LGBTQ2+, and non-binary individuals or newcomers. And statistically, uh, that's the group, unfortunately, that is more likely to feel or to experience violence or not feel insecurity. And one of the things that we, we have seen across the country is that there are more and more colleges that have what often people say is a safe place for indigenous people, which is a room where uh, they are, uh, they know there are resources, there are people that can support them, that can, they can talk to and also be among their peers. But what I'm hearing is that now some are also creating this for the LGBTQ+. And it's a place mm. that is considered 
as a safe place, like in fact, the Humber College as such a resource uh, center uh, in Toronto. And it's a place where they can promote a safer, braver, and positive space and where people can have access to resources. Same thing in Quebec, for example, there is a CEGEP that is called CEGEP André Lorando that created a bureau d'intervention et de prévention. So that's like an office of intervention and prevention where people can go talk to. And Pierre-Yves mentioned, you know, that, that people need to be aware of the potential risk, the, the events that may happen. So that's the kind of place where you can say, you know, I, I feel that there may be something that where people may react. There is a speaker that, you know, is controversial coming into the campus. So I want you to know about that because there could be, you know, uh, some violence or perceptions that there could be violence. And so these perceptions of not being safe. Mm, I like that idea of the carving out spaces at least where people can feel that they're comfortable. Um, so, you know, yes, that, that is what the entire campus could be, but, but in case that is a situation that you're still working on, that you can find these small spaces within the campus that people go, can go in and, and talk frankly about things and find the resources that they need. Uh, Craig, I, I'm gonna get, pull you in here. I mean, we've just heard about this, this growing list of things that people in your position have to think about when they think about safety on campus. I understand it's your job, but it seems to be complex, um, certainly seems to be ever-changing. Uh, as a leader, how are you doing? Question and for recognizing uh, my counterparts as well across the country who've engaged throughout COVID and beyond in not only keeping the wheels on the bus turning, but also uh, responding to students and colleagues' needs uh, throughout this period. And it's really interesting you should ask me because I, uh, I became president just six months before COVID uh, began. And in fact, just two months before uh, the global pandemic was declared, we actually lost two students to a drunk driver and also a faculty member on the flight, the Ukrainian flight that was um, shut down in Iran. And so health and safety have been at the forefront of my thinking uh, right from the beginning of, of, of being uh, a president. And, you know, you've talked throughout uh, the, this session about uh, colleges being a microcosm of uh, the, the greater uh, society. And, and we can't um, avoid, uh, you know, or, or step away from uh, society's challenges and shortcomings. We're very much part of those and the failings. But what we can do as learning institutions is to tap into that and to really challenge head on some of the elements that we've talked about today that are creating uh, the, the basis for, for feeling unsafe, for perceiving that we're unsafe, for, for the reality of, of, of being unsafe. Because, you know, people may come into my institution and others uh, bigoted, homophobic and racist. That's one thing. But if they leave this institution as bigoted and as racist as they joined it, then that's another. And we, we've got to make sure that that is challenged and that there is a change in views and thinking through our learning and curriculum and examining things both for colleagues and students through a human rights and social justice lens. That, 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 that's really uh, what I feel is at the heart of a learning institution, that we, we, we can play a role here. You know, I often think of uh, the Robin Williams movie, Dead Poet Society. You've heard the saying, carpe diem, seize the day. Well, actually taking literally, it means doing everything we can do today to make tomorrow better. And that's how really I, I, I've, I'm approaching this job, which you're absolutely right, um, 
feels uh, quite uh, a weight on, 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 on mine and, and colleagues' shoulders. But really, that's, that's what is my North Star, if you will. That's what drives us to, to, to make the changes we need to do. And it's not just within uh, our own learning community, important though that is, both in the classroom and with the co-curricular, but it's also um, within the communities we serve. I mean, Denise has, has always reminded me from the moment she met me how important colleges are to community. 95% of Canadians live within 50 kilometers of, of a college. And, and, and so we're at the heart of community. And you take COVID, for example, we're serving, Centennial serves Scarborough on the east side of the GTA. 70% of the population identify as, mm -hmm. as racialized tremendous health inequities. And as you can imagine, Scarborough was hit um, much more than, than other areas in terms of, of, of COVID uh, cases because of the systemic health inequities. And so we partnered from the very beginning with the local hospitals, what they call the Scarborough Health Network. And it wasn't just a case important again, though this was, of providing all our PPE, even designing PPE for, for uh, and producing that uh, for staff. Uh, at the hospitals, but also providing our students and our staff. And um, we uh, partnered with the Scarborough Health Network to provide what turned out to be one of the busiest vaccination uh, centres in the mm -hmm. GTA, achieving an 80% uh, vaccination rate. And just recently as well, you mentioned earlier around uh, the, the TTC and the violence on the TTC. Centennial, um, thanks to the leadership of our uh, student uh, association president, Tima Shah, and the student association hosted a meeting of, of, of local groups on this very issue of, 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 of uh, the TTC and, and striking and, and aiming for greater safety uh, on our public transportation systems through additional funding, enforcement um, and, and advocacy. And that's uh, the student association mobilizing and supporting our community as well. It's interesting that you say that, Craig, because I believe my parents were actually vaccinated <laughs> really early in this. So I am grateful to, to Centennial and it was it was well done. It was organized. Uh, yeah, you're right. Okay. And that is a, a racialized population. And, and I have to. Yeah, there is some credit due there for sure. You know, I, I, I find it interesting that you've actually kind of shifted the 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 perception of of you know this not just being safety not just being that something that you as a leader have to do so it's not just oh you know keep them safe get them out in the two or four years that they're here mm -hmm. but you've actually kind of repositioned it as an opportunity that your organization and other organizations across canada that have this huge role in the communities that they're in could actually change things and and i think that you know mckinsey talked earlier about the findings in the and she kind of hinted at that as well i know she was talking about mental health but the fact that institutions can take this as an opportunity to shape people and provide resources and point them uh, to how they deal yeah. with those things so that we are yes. not dealing with it five years later in an environment that isn't ready so actually you are a microcosm of society, but we could try little solutions here that then the larger community could try to replicate. That exactly. I love. Okay. Spot I love. And I'm Absolutely gonna get, spot I a, I, So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm seeing a couple of no, nodding faces. Uh, Denise, I'm going to start off with you. What resources are available to colleges and institutes for them to do this, this thing that Craig has just presented here and Mackenzie hinted at, what are the resources that are available for colleges that colleges and institutes that want to do that? So in fact, the main resources is how connected they are with their community. And because the, the and um, the reasons why I mentioned this is community reach out to them, the business sector reach out to the colleges and institutes and vice versa. So it's a very symbiotic relationship that exists. And uh, whatever you do on campus can have uh, 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 
can percolate or have repercussions or impact in the rest of the of the community so if i just look at uh, a cégep in quebec uh, saint jean sur richelieu they did a big big campaign on campus which was uh, la violence sexuelle c'est non so sexual violence it's no and this was a campaign to encourage lt attitudes practices and behaviors but because it was done on campus and with different partners it reverberated also in the rest of the of the community so uh, that's why whenever there are issues and you reach out to colleges or uh, colleges can do something about it, and not only on their campus, but also with the rest of the community that they work with. And I'm sure uh, Craig will have a concrete example of that <laughs> over at the, of the that. that he talked about. Okay, so I'm gonna seed an idea in, in Rebecca uh, Peary and Mackenzie's head because I'm gonna have let you have the last word. But I have a question for. But I'm gonna see. I, I have, I'm gonna go to Craig next. Uh, Craig next. But I'm gonna seed an idea in your head. Uh, we are going to end the session by me asking you. Craig has has redefined, or maybe other leaders knew it. He has redefined this as an opportunity. So I want you to have that in your head and be in about a minute, be able to tell me if there's one topic under the umbrella of health and safety that Canada's colleges and institutes can focus on and really think of it as an opportunity, as an opportunity to make a, a huge amount of change in young people so that we can then deal with it better when they're adults. So I'm gonna come back to you for that. But Craig, you heard what Denise just said right about about some of the 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 changes that she's seeing other campuses do can you talk about something an area of, in a minute or less an area that that you're working on um yeah. actively at your campus now that that you're hoping helps to again reset the environment and reset a group of people I can. The challenge will be whether I can do it in a minute. So you just uh, show me the cutoff sign and I'll stop speaking because as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this area. And I want to pick up on each point. Well, I, could, like, I could pick up on everybody's points, but each point about the, um, the table topics. We actually have a department called the Department of Emergency Management and Public Safety. And it, it's run around five elements of readiness. And one of those elements is emergency and incident management. And that is exactly what Eve was talking about. That's where the table topic exercises go. That's where we do the drills. And, and we're constantly, we've got a great team that's constantly uh, surveying the uh, potential scenarios, testing them out, and so on. Another element of that readiness pan is public safety and awareness so when our students come onto campus for orientation there is uh, awareness raising this this training available on an ongoing uh, basis the campus watch program for example but also with um, with uh, the, the security it's very important that they're constantly trained so in a mental health crisis for example how do they respond effectively um, Re I, Rebecca mentioned the technology is very very important so we've got emergency phones throughout the campuses and our parking lots and uh, you know the safety apps another area is beyond the uniform initiative i mean i think we could spend a whole um, session on how security uh, on campuses work and interact with students and that building of trust uh, that we, we really need to see and so we're working uh, beyond the uniform initiative to really ensure our, our security contribute in a positive very positive way to the open-hearted welcoming uh, and warm environment and environment that we want to create here at centennial college and then the the last element of this is about governance and it doesn't sound uh, you know it sounds a little bit boring but it's absolutely critical in getting these things right so harassment uh, for example and discrimination uh, policy has just been subject to a whole town hall review where students and colleagues are contributing to that to a new uh, feel and look and uh, of that harassment uh, policy so the now moving forward for example we'll make sure it's aligned to indigenous ways of knowing which we'd never done uh, before and we're also with a new building that actually uh, to the point about space <laughs> 
Oh, did you cut me off? I, mean, like, just... <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will just. I okay, just finish is... there. Then we're actually okay, going ten for seconds. a safety study. <laughs> No, I, I, you know what? I, I don't want to hog the space. I, you, you've given me good uh, time there. I'm sorry. I, I, we, we could go on. Maybe no, you'll invite me. Back. This is <laughs> <laughs> no. This is this is fantastic. I want to make sure that that. Do you want to take the ten yeah. seconds? Because I, I, you were talking about indigenous space. Can you quickly tell us about that? I find that really yes, interesting. They, so we've got a, a building uh, that we're we're we're, uh, we're we're going to be opening actually this fall that is in line with indigenous uh, um, architectural principles and indigenous ways of knowing and doing, and a real mm. uh, safe space and a community space for indigenous students, and not just uh, for our own students, but we really want to invite uh, uh, members of uh, indigenous community onto campus to use this space as well and that is about creating uh, safe spaces but the point as well about that is the well-being standard uh, we want a wellness standard for that building and part of that is about community and it's about mind and mental health and well-being thank you thank you thank you craig so having said that uh, Re rebecca i'm gonna uh, go to you each of you will get about 15 to 30 seconds, closer to the 15. Um, uh, Rebecca, let's start with you. What would you like to see colleges and institutes work on, Canada's colleges and institutes work on? My number one philosophy when it comes to safety in any capacity is be proactive, not reactive. And that comes down to the preparedness. It comes down to having systems in place. It comes down to being proactive about that communication so that um, it's muscle memory when the events do happen or when something comes up, you know what to do. And the people in charge know what to do. The people sitting next to you know what to do. So be proactive. Not Wonderful. Thank you. Mackenzie. To build on that, a great way to be proactive um, in making your community safe is to listen to students and specifically create relationships with the student bodies and student unions on your campuses. Um, Craig mentioned some great work being done by Tima, the president at his university, but each or at his college, but each university, college, polytechnic across Canada has student leaders that are working hard to make campus communities safer and in collaboration with institutions, um, great things can be done. Exactly. And you, that is such a great reminder on student leadership as well, who are who are tuned in and and across the front, not just, you know, the, the student associations, but some of the other groups that you get on campus too that have leaders that work really hard. Thank you, Mackenzie. Really good point. Piri, you get the last word. What would you like to see uh, Canada's uh, colleges and institutes do? Craig, your only problem is you don't have show enough passion about safety and security. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but no. What's what's important is, in my opinion, is to include safety and security in curriculum. So because uh, public uh, and private security mm. agencies have uh, do not have enough people showing up at their door, and safety and security oh. is the foundation of any of our public uh, public and private institutions. Something to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. How I know we've had a great chat is I feel like I've had a physical workout. Right? <laughs> That's how I know this has been such a great chat. So I'm going to say to everyone listening, uh, tell us what you make of our discussion here. We invite you to share your perspectives, questions, and comments using the email address that's appearing on the screen. And uh, if you want to stay on top of the latest developments in Canada's college sector, don't forget to visit CICAN's News Center, where you can also subscribe to Perspectives, the free bi-weekly electronic newsletter. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. You have been fabulous. Rebecca Edwards, safety reporter at safewise.com. Mackenzie Metcalf, Executive Director of the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations. Please look out for her report, uh, for her organization's report. Pierre-Yves uh, Bourdois, President at PY Public Safety Management, um, and Craig Stevenson, President and CEO of Centennial College, and of course, Denise Amio, President and CEO of CICAN. Join us for next month's Perspective Live episode. It'll be on March 15th, 2023. Uh, this year is it 2023 it is 2023 and it's a really fascinating topic we're going to be talking about how 
increasing equity, inclusion, and diversity in the labor market may help address labor shortages, something that we're seeing across the country, and also contribute to the prosperity of our communities. And we're going to talk about the role of colleges and institutes in training more equity-deserving groups that are ready for the workplace. I invite you to visit the Perspectives Live webpage where you can watch or re-watch all of our episodes. Hey, they make for great re-watches, so please do. My name is Manjula Selvaraja. Thank you for joining us. Stay well, stay healthy, and stay safe.